screen visible? Yes, yes, this is perfect. Thanks, uh, Dr. Amrita and Dr. Rajesh for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity and for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll just uh, talk about um, uh, what risk factors we need to look at uh, other than IOP in a glaucoma patient. Although whenever we talk about glaucoma, it's largely the IOP that we keep talking about. Uh, to understand that, uh, what we need to look at is the goal of treatment in glaucoma actually is to preserve the visual field of the patient and to prevent the loss of function, which is associated with the disease. Although we keep controlling the pressure, the primary goal is to prevent the uh, dysfunction or pre prevent the loss of visual function in a given patient. So it's not only lowering the IOP, but we need to look at other things also. That means improving the outflow towards the optic nerve and neuroprotection as well, so as to preserve the field. Now, I think for as, as far as the most important factor for progression or the visual field loss is definitely intraocular pressure. And the many landmark trials have proved that our EMGT trial tells us that with each millimeter drop in the <clears throat> sorry intraocular pressure, there is 10% risk reduction for uh, progression. Even the advanced glaucoma study says that if you reduce the pressure to 18 or less, it limits the progression and the field loss. And even collaborative uh, trial tells us that lowering intraocular pressure by 30% reduces the risk, even in NTG patient from 60% to 20%. So there is no doubt about it that we need to lower the intraocular pressure even in an NTG patient. But controlling intraocular pressure alone may not be enough. Because we know very well now that even with well-controlled intraocular pressure, we may continue or glaucoma patients may continue to lose sight. Almost 32% patients uh, going blind uh, had an IOP of less than 16 millimeter of mercury in a particular study. So we definitely need to have uh, take care of the other factors uh, as well, which includes the general care of the patient, vasoprotection, neuroprotection, etc. Now, how does that correlate? <clears throat> I'll take you uh, one by one. Well, in major NC RCT trials uh, that we have also, there are established risk factors for progression or development of glaucoma, which are like age, central corneal thickness, CD ratio, pattern standard deviation on uh, perimetry, disc hemorrhage and vasospasm. And there are many more which have been added later. So what we are looking at that how this uh, RGC death happens in glaucoma so that it compromise on a uh, visual function. So there are, the primary, of course, is raised intraocular pressure. Then there is hypoxia. Then there is imbalance or autonomous uh, sympathetic system involvement. There are certain ocular factors. There is blood flow to the optic nerve and also the CSF pressure which contributes. So how do we look at it in these patients is something that I'll take you through. There are certain things which are very obvious and we need to take care. I think Dr. Atuli has also um, uh, told us about central corneal thickness very well. It is important to check because it can mask an inaccurate reading of the eye pressure. So it is uh, it can lead us to inappropriate judgment if we don't look at it. So actual IOP may be underestimated if you have a thin cornea and overestimated in patients if you have a thicker cornea. So you may uh, label a patient uh, with thinner cornea as normal and uh, thicker corneas may be wrongly attributed as glaucoma or progression. So that is some point of caution that we need to keep in mind when we are talking about intraocular pressure being abnormal or normal or deciding about the target IOP. Well, there are other factors also which can cause intraocular pressure measurement uh, like how CCT is. So these factors also need to be keep in mind that kept in mind, that is uh, altered corneal biomechanics, which can happen due to many corneal lactatic disorders, post-refractive surgeries, even high myopic patients where the scleral rigidity is also compromised. Also, when we are measuring intraocular pressure, is it is always through cornea. So if you have a poor ocular surface, irregular cornea, scarred cornea, there are chances that our uh, pressure estimation whatever tonometer may, we may use may be uh, impaired. So we have to look beyond intraocular pressure also in these patients. Uh, th this hemorrhage has been identified as an important sign of progression. So I would just mention that, that it is important to look at because uh, not only uh, to diagnose early glaucoma when we have a normal intraocular pressure or raised intraocular pressure where you don't see any visual field change but uh, disc hemorrhage is something that uh, makes you uh, feel that this patient is suspect 
glaucoma. However, even in established glaucoma, if optic disc hemorrhage is suggestive of uh, progression, so that means you need to alter your treatment or uh, you know upgrade your treatment for a given patient, uh, even if the pressures are within the target range. So it is very important to look at, and uh, as Dr. Devan pointed out, that careful examination of an optic nerve head is the important factor. It can tell you regarding progression as well as diagnosis at a very early stage. So structure is very, very important. Another important thing that we need to keep in mind is that myopia has a little different presentation in glaucoma and also there is an overlap. So myopia being a risk factor and also there has been an overlap between the functional defects and structural defects of glaucoma and myopia. It has to be patients who are myopes have to be carefully examined and our um, threshold for suspecting glaucoma should be high so that we can pick up glaucoma early. Also, uh, similarly, uh, longitudinal observation may be required to understand whether myopes progress faster than the other uh, or immetropic or hyperopic patients who have glaucoma and uh, particularly when the pressures are within the normal range. Now, the, I will take you through the things which are not very obvious, but that is another uh, important aspect of glaucoma when we need to look at one of them is a ocular blood flow or the perfusion pressure that we have at the optic nerve so that so as to maintain its health so ocular blood flow depends a lot on mean arterial blood pressure and as well as intraocular pressure along with vascular resistance so it is important to look at the uh, blood pressure also when we are looking at the ocular blood flow. There, there it is a well known fact that patients with nocturnal hypotension do it's not hypertension, I'm sorry, it's hypotension that they progress and the change in systemic medication can help. Now, there are multiple vascular risk factors which can be responsible for progression of glaucoma and uh, many of them are very well known and uh, established by uh, many clinical trials that is vasospasm, nocturnal hypotension, even carotid artery disease, high cholesterol level, uh, increased blood viscosity, those are the uh, conditions which can uh, uh, cause progression or even cause normal tension glaucoma. So uh, just to give you an example, I'll take you through a case. This is a 70-year-old male, um, known case of hypertension. There was no relevant family history of glaucoma. Visual acuity was 6, 9, and 6, and intraocular pressure was 20 and 18 with a good uh, packy. So with this kind of a packy with 20 and 18 pressures, I would hardly be worried and gonioscopy being open angle, retina and macula were normal. And this is how the optic nerve looked like. So right eye had a 0.8 cup with an inferior notch, whereas left eye also had 0.7 cup and with some sloping rims. When we did the visual fields, uh, you could see that they correlate with what we see on the nerve. That means there was a superior defect and few, few in the right eye and few defects in the left eye as well. Now, the question was that why um, this is a HRT printout of the same patient. So here you see a lot much abnormality as compared to what you see in the fields because of the disc being um, uh, oblique and peripapillary crescent. So we will not give much importance to the imaging in this uh, situation right now. So we did a diurnal variation test as that's the first thing that you need to do if you see a damage uh, which is correlating with your structure and you see a normal office intraocular pressure. So as a routine, we do the blood pressure also of all the patients who under, undergo diurnal variation tests. So you can see very well, the pressures are less than 20 at all visits, at all timings, uh, but there was um, you know, hypotension that was noted, particularly in the midnight from the time 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. So this is typically uh, <clears throat> a normal tension glaucoma with a nocturnal drop in the uh, blood pressure. And so you need to definitely reduce the pressure as we know with the normal tension glaucoma study, but we also need to modify the dosage of antihypertensive in consult with the physician so as to stop the progression of the disease. So effect of hypotension has been well established and the patients have been divided into dippers and non-dippers based on how much is the fall that you see in the night. So if there is more than 10% fall in the diastolic uh, pressure at night that is those uh, group of patients are considered dippers and they are known to progress more uh, as compared to non-dippers because this directly affects the ocular perfusion pressure. There are multiple studies done and uh, most of the trials like six out of these nine studies document progression which is associated with nocturnal dips of blood pressure. So that is an important uh, thing to see. 
uh, why ocular blood flow is important is not only from the hypotension point of view, even when you have uh, raised intraocular pressure, that causes mechanical back pressure and re reduces the blood supply to the optic nerve. And that is how the ischemia and RGC cell loss happens. So that is a direct mechanism for uh, retinal ganglion cell loss. And it is important to be looked at. There has been some role of uh, vasoprotection. Uh, 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 I mean, I would say not so strong evidence, but dorsalamide does, uh, is supposed to increase the op optic nerve head blood flow. So if we are looking at patients where the op ocular blood flow is, uh, optic nerve head blood flow is compromised, their dimox or do uh, sorry, dorsalamide may have uh, larger role than other uh, anti-glaucoma medications. There are certain studies which tell us that uh, the AVP times were better with the uh, dorsalamide than other uh, uh, anti-glaucoma medications. So that is one uh, another thing that can be used in these patients. Well, going forward, uh, I'll show you another case. Uh, this patient came for a second opinion for glaucoma. And this is a very old patient of mine. Uh, the pressures at that time were 16 and PACI were uh, low, 480 and 490. However, gonioscopy was open angles. And this is how this was in 2004. And the fields looked completely normal. So with the 16 pressure, I was not too worried about this patient. But what I had noted at that time in this patient was... Um, this is how the optic nerve looked like, which looked like completely physiological. I did not see any um, RNFL defect or any thinning of the nerve. The only thing I noted here was, if you can look at that vessel, the arteriolar narrowing that was there, and that is what I noted in my file. And I thought, we'll just follow up this patient. I did not start on any treatment. Now, incidentally, that patient was lost to follow up. And when came back to me in 2011, this is how her fields looked like. So I was blaming myself for why did I not uh, uh, investigate further or start treatment, but I had no um, sort of indication to start treatment in that particular patient, but I did not investigate her further at that time for any systemic issues, although I had noted the arterial or narrowing. And in 2011, she came to me with this kind of fields, and uh, this was the GDX done in 2011, which <clears throat> showed a significant effect on the right eye. Now, uh, of course, this patient was diagnosed as normal tension glaucoma here. Also, we did a full day dianal variation and uh, we started treatment with dorsolamide eye drops. And uh, when I did the systemic evaluation uh, in view of arteriolar narrowing that we had noted, her cholesterol levels, particularly triglycerides, were high. And then uh, she was started with the statins. Now she's been on follow up with me and has been stable for long. So those are certain things that uh, we need to look at in addition to the regular workup of a glaucoma patient when you see the unusual progression despite normal intraocular pressure. Another important uh, factor to look at is um, OSA and glaucoma, that is the uh, obstructive sleep apnea. This is considered a major risk factor for developing glaucoma. Uh, there, is, uh, there are multiple studies showing a strong association between uh, sleep apnea and uh, glaucoma. Actually speaking, any patient who has obstructive sleep apnea, a complete ophthalmic evaluation should be advised at every follow-up. And glaucoma patient, particularly with opacity and progressive visual field damage, even under low pressure, should be evaluated or at least a history should be asked about the sleep apnea and other sleep disorders. 10% <clears throat> of patients with sleep apnea do have glaucoma and close to 50% of NTG patients do have a history of sleep apnea. So they should be evaluated. In fact, I have a patient whom, a uh, young patient with the uh, normal tension glaucoma around, uh, around 54 years of age. And uh, he was progressing. And at one point when we uh, discussed about the sleep apnea, he gave me the give the history of uh, sleep apnea or snoring. We got him evaluated for uh, the sleep study and all, and it was started on uh, BiPAP for the night. And he actually uh, stabilized after that. So that's very important. How does this work? Actually, obstructive sleep apnea is something that uh, works in multiple ways to cause glaucoma. One is hypoxia due to oxidative stress and inflammation, thereby causing directly mitochondrial dysfunction and RGC death. In um, um, relationship with the vascular factors, all these uh, things contribute, sympathetic activity, autonomous dysfunction and vascular dysfunction, raised intracranial pressure in these patients, they directly affect the blood flow and perfusion pressure of the optic nerve. And that's how, again, glaucoma happens. And third is a mechanical factor where 
because mostly they are obese patients and uh, lie in supine position and uh, snoring happens. And that's how they develop the raised IOP at that position and then uh, glaucoma happens. So that is another important factor to be looked at when we are talking about normal pressure glaucoma. Role of cerebral uh, CSF pressure is very, um, you know, uh, is beginning to come up now. The important uh, thing that we need to understand in relation to that is that RGC damage actually occurs at the level of lamina cribrosa. So it is definitely important to look at that pressure, uh, more importantly than intraocular pressure also. But it is not, uh, uh, I mean, it's not easy to look at the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. In a, there is no non-invasive technique where you can look at it and it is easy to look at the intraocular pressure. So when it becomes easily measured, it would be more amenable to check. Having said that, even if you're able to measure the CSF pressure, whether uh, we can modify that or no is another question. So right now we don't um, do much regarding that because there's no way that we can alter the CSF pressure even if we uh, detect it to be uh, higher in these patients. So just to summarize, uh, what I would say that in a patient who has definite glaucoma with open angles and there is high IOP, we definitely go ahead with the IOP lowering medication and see whether the patient is stable or progressing. But if you have a patient with normal office intraocular pressure, you definitely need to do a dynal or at least an office dynal pressure <clears throat> to have multiple readings at multiple times. If there is a raised IOP, again, it gets treated as a normal POAG, but if the pressures are normal, you need to look at 24 hours pressure. You need to look at sympathetic, autonomic sympathetic activity assessment. You need to look at ocular blood flow because those are the things you can still control and provide an additional support for treatment in addition to lowering the intraocular pressure. So if your BP is uh, lower than 10% at the night time, so those are classified as dippers, then you can adjust the BP medication accordingly with the physician. If it is a non-dipper, you mainly look at uh, other factors like sleep apnea and chronotherapy. Patients with abnormal autonomic activity, uh, lifestyle changes and systemic medications can be uh, advised along with glaucoma treatment. Ocular blood flow, if it is normal, we go ahead with the intraocular pressure lowering medicines. But if there is low ocular blood flow, um, <clears throat> that can be improved based on what is the cause, like if there's high cholesterol or hyperviscosity hypotension, those things can be looked at. And if there is progression, despite of um, achieving target intraocular pressure, again, we need to look at these things like autonomic effects of ocular or systemic medication and looking at the all these things which I spoke about in, the, in glaucoma with normal intraocular pressure. So <clears throat> in nutshell, even if you have a patient with normal intraocular pressure, you need to look at Multiple readings, not a single reading, preferably full day DVT along with CCT. Blood flow needs to be kept in mind. We should be checking at least a basic systemic evaluation for these patients. Um, and if it is an established NTG, eco carotid Doppler goes a long way. Uh, certain situations, particularly young patients, we need to also rule out neurological issue and one-time ischemia because that can mimic glaucoma. We should check for the history of sleep apnea and Renaud's phenomena. And if there is relevant uh, indication, we should be investigating on those lines. So to conclude, glaucoma is perhaps more of a multifaceted disease rather than uh, a single uh, organ disease and uh, much less understood than all other eye conditions because we need to keep in mind the ocular, vascular, neurological involvement. Also, much of the confusion stems from glaucoma being neurodegenerative and having a vascular etiology itself, whereas only intraocular pressure is the one that we can detect and modify. Uh, thank you for your kind attention.